this cool video highlighting what they do with Involve International. God be glory. <laughs> How many of you are thankful today that the Lord is still building his church? This is good news, right? Uh, someone pointed out that I'm wearing the same shirt as when I was dancing, so I'm offering dance lessons after service if you need to know how to do that. It's actually the only time I've ever done it in my life, and I will not be repeating it anytime soon. All right. Um, we love you guys dearly. It is such a joy and a privilege to be back uh, with our city family today. We consider this uh, one of our home churches, and as a missionary, it's just such a joy to see so many familiar and friendly faces, so many people have been praying for us. Thanks so much for the encouragement. Uh, just as a re quick recap, we're celebrating 200-some churches planted in Burundi, Kenya, and Eastern Congo. Um, it's actually, the number is now 222, just so we could be more spiritual for Sunday morning. Not just kidding, but it's just such a joy to uh, see what Jesus is doing in building his church. City Church is one of our primary uh, partners in that, so thank you so much for continuing to have a heart to believe that this is indeed the hour to see uh, missional bodies planted uh, globally. Um, I am going, to, uh, Bailey's also here with me today. She'll be leading us through communion, so uh, we'll have a, a transitional point here at the end of the message. Uh, but I just feel like I'm supposed to dive right into uh, the message today. And so if you have your Bibles or cc.guide, we're going to Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 11, and then verses 17 through 21. Pastor Matt told me to make myself at home as if I was in Africa, so normally I preach for two hours in Africa. Today I'm just going to go one hour and 50 minutes. That's my guess, uh, gift to you guys, all right? So uh, the word of the Lord says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. 
Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever you, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God came near. Jump to verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Father, thank you for your word today. Would you speak to us? We pray this now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, I'd like to talk to you for the next few moments about the idea of missional shift, all right? Missional shift. Um, I know some of you prefer something a little bit more academic and intellectually uh, geared, so I came up with a secondary title of Ecclesiastical Engagement for Missiological Momentum and Pneumatic Praxis, but <laughs> it was a little bit heavy for first service, so I prefer just to stick with missional shift. Is that okay? Okay, phew, thank God. I didn't want to have to preach the other one anyways. Uh, Luke, and that's a joke, okay. Um, Luke chapter 10, some of you are like, oh my goodness, this guy is too serious. No, that's a joke, okay. Um, Luke chapter 10 is going to show us a passage where Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand this idea of a paradigm shift as it relates to the mission of God. We know that Luke is the author, and one of Luke's primary themes that he will bring out over and over again is the idea that Jesus' mission is the kingdom with a capital K for all people, all right? And that includes the Gentiles. That includes every tribe, every tongue, every nation. But in order for this to become a reality, the disciples have to have some kind of a paradigm shift, missionally speaking, because they're just not really getting it. Uh, when the movie The Lion King uh, first came out and people found out that I grew up in Kenya and I spoke uh, Swahili, several people would ask me, we heard that song that Rafiki the baboon sings is in Swahili, Asante sana, squash banana, mimi nungu, we we apana, right? I know, I have CDs available after service. We don't even do CDs anymore. Okay, never mind. And they're like, can you help us understand what this uh, means? And I'd be like, okay, yeah, let's go through it. Asante means thank you. Okay, we got that. Sana, sana means a lot, so it's thank you a lot. And then they would ask me this question, what does squash banana mean? And I'm like, all right, slow down just for a second and say it back three times. Squash banana, squash banana. What do you think squash banana means, right? It means squash banana. It's English, right? Some of you are like, yeah, that's a good question. No, it means squash banana, okay? And so as I thought about that, I think that this is the same kind of challenge that the disciples are having in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is saying kingdom, and they're hearing a political kingdom, and Jesus is saying mission, and they're saying, yeah, we're going to take out the Romans, and Jesus is like, no, actually, this is not a political kingdom. This is a spiritual kingdom, and I didn't come to overthrow the Romans. I came to defeat the powers of darkness and overcome the forces of the evil one through the enemy, Satan, right? Say squash banana, right? That's what Jesus is saying. Say kingdom, say mission. Get on point with what I'm trying to do is what Jesus is trying to communicate. And so in chapter nine, Jesus realizes, hey, they're maybe not getting it as I would hope they would. So I'm gonna send them on a practical assignment. And so he sends out the 12 disciples as representatives of his kingdom. And then we land in chapter 10, which is the passage that we just read today. And it's interesting because he's going to expand the mission even more to include 72 disciples, and he's going to divide them in teams of two. So he's sending out 36 different groups of people, and I think they're going to start microchurches, right? And I know it's microchurch Sunday, but I just think like this is a beautiful tie-in to what God's doing at City Church. And if you keep reading through Luke and Acts, because originally it was all one manuscript, you're going to discover that in this continuum, Luke is actually saying that going on mission is not an exception to the rule. It is normal biblical discipleship in Christianity, right? And so he's going to paint this picture for us that if you say yes to Jesus, what you're ultimately saying yes to is not just a get out of hell free card. You're saying yes to the mission and the kingdom of God. 
And so I love what Dr. Chris Wright says in the UK. He says, it's not so much that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. So often I hear people saying, well, if we could just find the mission, we, we don't have to find the mission. The gospels describe the mission. What Jesus is looking for is a group of people who will embrace the mission and say, Lord, we are on assignment, kingdom assignment to ensure that your name is known to the world that we live in. Bailey and I put it this way. We like to say it, um, me, uh, the whole purpose of the whole church is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. The whole purpose of the whole church is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. So here in Luke chapter 10, I want to give us a framework um, on some of the missional shifts that are occurring in the disciples. And my prayer today as I was putting this message together is that it could be that these are some missional shifts that need to occur in my life and in your life as we take the next steps forward in terms of living lives that are of, of kingdom significance in the hour and the age that we live in. And to do this, I came up with five verbs that will help us uh, kind of keep track of where we are in the passage. So the idea is so, go, show, know, and grow, all right? So, go, show, know, and grow. So let's look at this uh, first um, uh, shift here that has to occur. And this is the idea of so. And I wrote in the notes from passivity to participation. And I would suggest that this is really the place of prayer. Did you notice in verse uh, number two that Jesus is going to connect prayer with mission and kingdom activity? Now, we know that Jesus is headed to 36 places where it says that he's about to go, and he's assigned the disciples, and then he tells them, I want you to pray about this assignment. Now, I'm thinking, well, okay, they've never been there before, so if we're going to pray about a place that we've never been before, a good prayer might be, Lord, hurry up and get here to bring in your harvest, because I have no idea what's going on, Right? Or maybe another prayer would be, Lord, let the ripeness of the harvest be so ripe that we don't have to actually do any work. The harvest just literally jumps into our arms because you've done all the work, right? And I would like to call these passive prayers because they put all the pressure on God. And it sounds really, really spiritual, except that it easily excuses us from personal responsibility in the mission of Jesus. Instead, what does Jesus say pray about? He says, pray that my Father would raise up harvesters. Why? I suggest it's because prayer is the seedbed for kingdom calling. And without a secure calling, people will quickly abandon the mission. In other words, Jesus is going to ask the disciples um, to be an answer to their own prayers. And can I just do a caveat for a second? If you want your prayer life to go to a whole nother level, shift from praying, God do this and God do that, and begin to pray, Lord, how can I be a part of the very thing that I'm praying about right now? Listen to what Spurgeon says about the importance of prayer in this passage. He says, now the Greek is much more forcible. It is that he would push them forward and thrust them out. It's the same word which is used for the expulsion of a devil from a man who is possessed. It takes great power to drive a devil out. It will need equal power for God to drive a Christian into his work. Uh, I'm going to tell some stories as we illustrate all of these different points today. And so to set this up, you're going to see a picture of a map of Burundi with uh, churches on it. And this is uh, 137 churches which have now been planted in the beautiful nation of uh, Burundi through Involved uh, International. And our mission statement from day one is, was to plant a healthy church within walking distance of uh, the people of Burundi. And so you'll see uh, slide number two here. How do we do this? Well, we do this through a church planting school that this church called City Church helped us start. Have you ever heard of City Church? Like three of us in the room? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. And what's been so awesome about it is that every year the number of church planters has only increased. So this was uh, the first week of June, and we now have 49 church planters. And what's really cool is to hear their stories because some of them were teachers, some of them were farmers, some of them were business people, some of them were soldiers. There's at least two nursing moms and a couple of teenagers, just regular Burundians who, as they begin to pray, they begin to hear the call of God echoing in their spirit like we have to be a part of the kingdom assignment and mission to reach this beautiful country of Burundi. And one of the things that we always teach our church planters is this, as we talk about calling, if Stephen and Bailey called you to plant the church, it will definitely fail. If you called yourself to plant the church, it's not going anywhere. If your pastor called you to plant your church, it won't succeed. But if Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who made a promise, 
promise and said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. If he's the one who called you to plant the church, then we can guarantee no matter what opposition comes your way, it will succeed, right? And so it's been beautiful as we've, as, we've, as we've seen year after year these individuals embracing Jesus and embracing his calling uh, over their life. And so I would just suggest this today. Our world is hungry for an authentic kingdom witness. A ripe harvest can't get any riper without spoiling. The issue is not, Lord, make people more ripe. The issue is who amongst us will stand up and say, Lord, I hear that call and I want to be a part of your mission in terms of seeing your kingdom advance in the generation and hour that we live in, right? So there has to be a shift from spiritual passivity to spiritual participation, okay? That's the idea of so. Then we have the second idea of go, and this is this idea of the place of obedience, from experience to obedience. And I would suggest this morning that too often we approach the kingdom based on our experience instead of a simple posture of obedience that says, yes, Lord, I'll do what you are asking me to do. And I think many times it's because we want a guarantee of outcomes, right? Anybody ever come before the Lord and says, okay, I know I've done this, Lord, I'll get involved, but I need some guarantees that certain things are gonna fall into place first, right? But what we discover in this passage is that outcomes are in God's hands and our response has to be one of obedience, not a negotiation of success, Look at what Jesus says here in verses eight and nine. He says, as you go into these different towns where I'm sending you, some people are gonna be open. Some people are gonna receive you. Stay there, live with them, share your life with them. And then the very next verse, verses 10 and 11, he says, others won't receive you. And in fact, they very well may be hostile and they might reject the message. So what does Jesus say to do if they reject you? Does he say, call your lawyer and fight for your legal rights? Does he say, cancel them on social media and make a nasty TikTok post because God forbid they didn't listen to the message? Or does he say, post some outrage videos because you know it's good to get upset and that's always a healthy Christian witness? No, Jesus says either way, whether you're welcomed or unwelcomed, whether you're received or rejected, whether you're valued or despised, stay on mission, share the message of the kingdom wherever you you are, be the gospel. Anybody ever heard that one before? And so I think oftentimes when we hear that, we're like, well, yeah, in the context of everyone being conducive and receptive to the word that I want to share, I'll be the gospel. Yeah, but what about when there's opposition and hostility and things aren't going your way? Like this is the challenge of living on mission to see Jesus glorified in the day and age that we live in, right? And so I would just suggest today, let God take care of the results. You and I are called to be faithful. You and I are called to persevere, and the beauty of perseverance is that you see God do what you couldn't do for yourself, right? And so here's uh, Pastor Jean-Baptiste. He's one of our dear brothers. We love him so much. Somewhere around 2020, he feels uh, stirred in his heart to plant a church, and like any good church planter, he's convinced that it's going to be a church of great significance if he can plant in a prominent place. And so he lives in northeastern Burundi, and he was hoping to plant in one of the larger towns up there, and instead the door opens for him to go to a place called Gasenyi. Now, Gasenyi is so small You can't even find it on Google. I've tried multiple times. I've been there three times, and I'm always like, where are we going again? Like, if Google doesn't know that, it must not even be a real place, right? And so here's this idea that if Burundi is one of the poorest countries in the world, then Gesenyi is one of the poorest places in the country of Burundi. And so can you see him wrestling with God? Like, Lord, why would you send me to such an insignificant place? And one night, he has a dream. And in the dream, the Lord confirms to him, nope, it's Gesenyi, and I need you to be faithful. And so he launches the church with a whopping total of two other people, a blind guy and some woman that he had met randomly on the street, and he invited them in their living room. And two weeks later, the woman died, and everybody in the town began to make fun of him because he's a pastor of one blind guy, right? And so he gets chased out of the first place that he went to start. He got chased out of the second place, and he told me he just kept being willing to say yes and be consistent and persevere in his obedience to this calling that the Lord gave him. And today, if you go to Gesenyi in northeastern Burundi, it's so beautiful. There's about 100 believers that gather on a Sunday morning, and he started a sewing project. Remember, it's one of the poorest places in one of the poorest countries in the world, and he helps the widows and young ladies learn how to sew so that their level of income can be transformed. How many of you know that when you are obedient to go, you put the results in God's hands at some point, the kingdom breaks in, Jesus is glorified, and lives begin to get changed for his glory, right? 
Amen. So we have this idea of so, we have this idea of go, and then the third one here is this idea of show, right? Show. And this comes out uh, in this idea of the place of ministry, and I wrote from presentation to demonstration, from presentation to demonstration. Listen to Paul for a moment. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So what Paul is saying is this. He's saying, if I can talk you into following Jesus, somebody else can probably talk you out of following Jesus. But if you encounter the presence and power of the living God in your heart and in your life, then when other contrary voices come your way and begin to say, well, you know, it's probably a good time to embrace all that deconstruction stuff, you know, then you stand and you say, actually, I have a personal encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? And so for Luke and for most New Testament authors, the kingdom is both presentation and demonstration. It's communication and manifestation. And here in Luke 10, uh, Jesus is telling us that while the kingdom is a message, the kingdom is also a movement. I like to think of it as the movements of a king, right? Kingdom, two words, king and domain. It's the domain, it's the rule, it's the reign of the king. And the movement of the kingdom of God is not just religious talk and spiritual messages and doctrinal statements, and I just don't know if I understand all that biblical terminology. Rather, what is being communicated here is that it is communication, it is presentation, but it's so much more than that. It's the authority of of heaven's government to forgive sin. It's the power of the king to defeat Satan's dominion. It's the power of God to heal sick bodies as well as sick minds and sick emotions and broken hearts and shattered relationships, right? And what we know about Luke is that Luke is a physician. And so anytime Luke is gonna talk about healing, like I I zone in on that because there's probably a reason that he would want to include that. And so Luke here connects kingdom and healing. So Jesus says, here's the message, guys. Tell them the kingdom is near. Now, how do, what does this mean? How can this be? Well, in a physical sense, we know it's because the king is coming soon, right? Every place he was about to go. But in a spiritual sense, the kingdom is a new reality that is ready to break forth in the hearts and minds of everyone who will receive Jesus as the king. And Jesus says, as you communicate this message, don't leave out the demonstration part. Heal the sick. Did you guys catch that part there? I love in the Greek, it's therapeo. It means uh, where we drive the English words therapy or therapeutic from, right? And so I think we can talk about kingdom, we can talk about healing, we can talk about movement, and we go, yeah, 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 we get it. But I would suggest here in the West, the reality is that we don't get it. We live in a democracy in the middle of an election cycle, and when we say kingdom, we hear election. And we translate that to mean vote for Jesus on the Sunday morning ballot by going to church and singing a song or two. Meanwhile, Monday through Saturday, you do you. And the kingdom comes along and pushes back against that and says, if you want to be a part of the movement of the kingdom, of the breaking in of the rule and reign and the domain of who Jesus is, it's not a part-time lordship and a part-time savior. It's a full-time commitment that says, Lord, I am willing to engage in what you're speaking and doing and what you want to release in the hour that we live in. Can I just suggest today that the king is on the move and if you want to be a part of this movement, then partial surrender to him actually misses the whole idea of the kingdom. We do not get full-time healing for our hearts, emotions, and minds by serving a part-time Lord. E. Stanley Jones once said this about this passage. If it's true that every thought and attitude is registered within your mortal body, then does the kingdom of God make for health or for illness or is it neutral? He then says, God's will, God wills health, and the kingdom of God is God's total program for health. Health to the mind, health to the soul, health to the body, health to society. Every single principle and attitude of the kingdom is health producing and health maintaining. Call the roll call of those principles and attitudes, and everyone, if practiced, would produce health. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. We call these the fruit of the Spirit. These fruits are fruitful in producing health every single one of them. On the screen, you'll see a picture of uh, Etienne. We love Etienne, he's uh, like our little brother now. Uh, Etienne decides to go to church planting school somewhere around 2021. And he uh, comes from a family of about uh, 12 people, which in Burundi is pretty normal, right? And so he's the only believer. And he tells the story that 
Growing up, he gives his life to Christ about seventh grade, maybe sixth grade, and his family is irate. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They would deprive him of food. Sometimes they'd lock him out of the house, but he just kept being faithful, kept sharing the gospel, and slowly, one by one, today, 11 of the 12, no Christ of his family, right? Beautiful picture. And he says he gets this call, and so he comes to church planting school. He graduates, and he says, hey, uh, I I ask him, where do you want to plant a church? He goes, "Ah, I don't want to plant a church. And I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on. Church planting school means that when you graduate, you go and plant fill in the blank, okay? Your turn. And he's like, I don't want to plant a church. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not getting the picture here. Church planting school means, you guys get the idea. And he's like, no, I feel the Lord's like speaking to me like I'm supposed to go and be an evangelist. And I'm like, oh no, one of those guys, right? And I have nothing against evangelists, but you guys know the routine, right? And so I'm kind of like scratching my head and he says, no, 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 you don't understand. When we go and plant these churches, we could have evangelists campaigns that would coincide with the launching of the new church and instead of reaching 50 to 100 people which is about the normal amount we reach in the first three months of planting the church we could reach five or six hundred people and I'm like eh, all right all right you got my attention and so he decides to start going door to door and he would show up he says hi my name is Etienne uh, I want to talk to you about Jesus and then they would say okay and then he'd say is there anybody here that's sick that I can pray for And he would start going into people's houses and lo and behold, Jesus started healing people and people started getting saved and people started coming to the local churches. And today, when a new church plant goes in, all of the pastors are like, the church planters are like, can you send Etienne? Because when Etienne comes at 26 years old, fire breaks out in our community. People get saved, people get healed, right? This beautiful idea that you and I, as we align ourselves with the kingdom, we are called to also demonstrate, not just communicate, right? And so here's this idea of so, go, show. And then number four is the idea of no, right? No. And I would say that this is a shift from apathy to authority. And this takes us to the latter half of our passage. And I would suggest that this is the place of spiritual warfare. Did you see the disciples come back? And they're pretty jazzed. You can just hear it in their voice. They're like, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Uh, next uh, week, we're starting a new series here at City. Uh, it's going to be called The Unseen. Pastor Matt will kick us off. Uh, it's going to be an intensive series on spiritual warfare. So I'm not going to go deep here. I'm just going to make an observation because Pastor Matt and others will take this and run with it. But the observation I want to make here is this. It's interesting that in three verses, verses 17, 18, and 19, there are five direct or indirect allusions to satanic power. There's a mention of demons, there's a mention of Satan, serpents, scorpions, and the enemy's power. And the disciples come back to Jesus, and did you see what they said? They said, Lord, in your name, every single one of those categories of satanic power and demonic opposition had to submit and surrender to the name of Jesus Christ. Woo, that's powerful right there, right? And I love that they bring out the idea that the key seems to be the name of Jesus, right? Um... We were in uh, northern Kenya uh, just a couple weeks ago. It was our first time up there, and it's kind of a desert area. And so we were going to bed. It's like 11 o'clock at night. We were sleeping in a tent. This is Bailey and I when I say we. And I saw something go crawling across the floor, but I didn't see it clearly. I just caught the corner of my eye, and I thought it was a large cockroach. And so I grab a can of bug spray, right? And so I go up behind the little piece of furniture in the tent, and I just start spraying because I thought, if it's a cockroach, a little spray, it's done. Bailey doesn't even have to know it's in the room. We're all good, right? And so I'm spraying, and the scorpion comes out. And when I say scorpion, you're thinking this. No, it's like this. And it's not one of those little tails. It's like one of those tails. Like, you know, if this thing gets you, you're done. And it's like 12 hours to the largest urban center where there's a hospital. And so I'm starting to sweat a little bit. I'm spraying more, and the scorpion's scurrying, and the spray's coming out even more. And it goes around around the corner into the bathroom and Bailey may or may may not have been in the bathroom and she goes, "Ah, it's a scorpion, kill it. I'm like, I'm trying. And this goes on. If you follow her on Instagram stories, she caught the latter half of it. I sprayed this thing. It seemed like for an eternity and it was almost like laughing at me. Oh, give me your best shot, right? And so as the spray's coming out, Bailey's like, get something bigger, get a weapon, get something to kill it. And so I look around, she hands me her sandal and I go, and it goes, scorpion guts everywhere, right? And what had 
protracted for that long, in a moment it was dealt with. And I think, I think, I think what the disciples are saying in this moment is when you confront spiritual resistance and spiritual demonic uh, authorities that try to hinder and block the gospel, you have to have the right weapon. And the right weapon is not your, you know, theological background or what, I'm a member at City Church or uh, Pastor Matt's, but the, the, the correct weapon here is the name of Jesus Christ, right? The correct idea here is that you and I, when we are in a alignment with the king of kings when we are on mission with him then we have access to the authority of jesus christ and that authority is greater than every other authority every other name every other title and every other power that tries to hinder the gospel of jesus christ right uh you're gonna see a picture of janine she's on the screen behind me i've told you two stories about church planters well really an evangelist and a church planter um but this is one of regular member and so one time I was preaching, someone was like, yeah, but what do regular Christians look like in Burundi? And so I thought this would be a good story to use to illustrate that. Janine lives in central Burundi in a place where witchcraft is predominant. So much so that a neighbor hired a witch doctor to curse her and her legs and stomach swelled to the point that she was unable to function. So she decides to visit six other witch doctors to ask them to break the spell. And the last witch doctor finally said, this is too powerful of a spell for even me to break. You're going to die. Just go home. And that's the end of it. Amazingly, I love the Lord's timing. Amazingly, a new church had just gone in her community. Right now, is it 11 churches? One church is being planted every 11 days between Burundi, Eastern Congo, and Kenya. It's beautiful, right? And so a new church had just gone in, and there was a team of believers that were on mission. They were going door to door. They knock on our door, and they say, hi, we're the believers from such and such a community, and this church, would you be, you know, allow us to share Jesus? And she says, well, I'm about to die. You can talk about Jesus, but it's probably not going to do any good. And they said, well, can we pray for you? And what I love so much about this story is they didn't call for the pastor. They didn't call for someone in the deliverance ministry, just a group of regular believers got together and they began to pray, which in Kirundi means in the name of Jesus Christ. And as they lay hands on this woman, she's instantaneously and totally healed. And today she's leading worship at her church. Come on, somebody. You got to know when Jesus is glorified and magnified, Ah, he changes everything. And I love this thought. Like some of us are like, well, yeah, that sounds good because you've been walking with the Lord for 20 years. No, 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 no. The moment you give your life to Jesus, you have access to all of Christ's authority. So we have so, we have go, we have show, we have no. And now we're landing on the last one, which is grow. And those of you who heard me speak before, you know that when a missionary from Africa says that they're closing, it doesn't mean anything, okay? <laughs> <coughs> So it's the idea of grow. And I put in your notes, from joy to joy, from joy to joy. You say, well, and this is the place of maturity, all right? You say, is that, is that a typo? Like joy to joy? Shouldn't it be something to joy or joy to something else? And here's what I've discovered. It's not a typo. Missional living can only be sustained by authentic joy. If joy is non-negotiable, then the question is, what is the source of the joy? And they see a contrast being set up here in Luke chapter 10. The disciples are rejoicing for one reason, but Jesus is rejoicing for a different reason. And I love that Luke is going to pause and record that Jesus uh, rejoiced. It's one of two times in the whole Bible. I looked up the Greek word here because I'm nerdy like that. <laughs> and it's agaleleo. It's, it's, it's a word that translated that means to jump for joy or to be exceedingly glad in exultation. Now, I don't know what your background is in terms of your religious tradition, but oftentimes when we think about Jesus, we think of this stoic, you know, individual who's very spiritual, who doesn't really have a lot of joy in his life, right? And Luke, I think, is attempting to demolish this stereotype right here in this moment, right? A simple dynamic translation could read, he leapt for joy in the Holy Spirit. So something has so moved his emotions that he was unable to contain himself. He's leaping up and dancing in the Holy Spirit with exceeding gladness and joy. And then he looks at his disciples and he tells them to rejoice as well. And they think, well, yeah, of course we're going to rejoice. We have just discovered spiritual warfare. All of the demons, they submitted in your name and it's wonderful, Lord. And can you see Jesus smile? And he goes, nah, that's actually not the reason that you're supposed to rejoice. It's not because demons are subject to you. It's not because you have spiritual power flowing in your life. He says, rather, it's because your names have been recorded and written in heaven. It's rather that there's now a guaranteed eternity 
with my Father. It's Jews and Gentiles together around the throne. It's the nations gathered in passionate worship, delivered from the dominion of darkness. It's those faithful, precious brothers and sisters in Gassenyi. It's Etienne going to all the new churches in western Burundi. It's, it's, it's this beautiful picture that in eastern Congo and in Kenya, the gospel is still going forth. The movement of the kingdom has never ceased since the king came to this planet 2,000 years ago. And there's not a tribe, there's not a tongue, there's not a nation, there's not a location where his message and his kingdom will not extend and will not break in before he comes back, right? And I think that that's what's that's what Jesus is seeing. That's where the joy is coming from. That's, there's this internal well that's, that, 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 that's bubbling up inside of him. Meanwhile, Luke says, or Jesus says, Luke records it, uh, I saw Satan falling like lightning. Now, you can debate this theologically from multiple stand, vantage points. I'm not here to do that in this message. Um, but for me, I think it's because the devil finally realizes he doesn't just have to contend with Jesus. He has to contend with the 36 teams of two by two who are launching micro churches all over this particular area of Judea. He knows that he has to contend with believers like you and me in a place called City Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who are rising up in this hour and are saying, you know what? We may not be perfect, which none of us are. We may not be the most qualified. We may not be the smartest. We may not be the brightest, but we are committed to this idea of living the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that the people around us have an opportunity to encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? So I'm going to, uh, Spurgeon says this about this, uh, this passage. He says, so where the gospel is preached with divine power, Satan comes down from his throne in human hearts and human minds. As rapidly as the lightning flash falls from heaven and when we see his kingdom shaken, then like Jesus, we rejoice in spirit. I've got good news for you today, brothers and sisters. You can rejoice in spirit even in the midst of trying obstacles and contexts that don't make any logical sense, can I just remind you that if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation and you are a part of an eternal kingdom that is taking ground. And regardless of what the media or any political spin may say, Jesus is still the king and he is on a mission and he is going to raise up a glorious, pure bride in this final hour that will represent him beautifully to the nations that we live in. This is Pastor Simeone, last story. Burundi has three tribes, the Hutu, the Tutsi, and the Batwa. The Batwa are the pygmies. They are the most marginalized of the three tribes. They're actually despised by the other two tribes. And according to most missiological compendiums, as of about 20 years ago, there was no known uh, Batwa believers in Burundi. And that was about the same time that Simeone gave his life to Jesus. It's cool how the Lord sets these things into motion even 20 years ago. And as he gives his life to the Lord, he feels this call, like, I know I'm supposed to grow, but there's no churches in my entire area. What should I do? And he hears about a church that was two and a half hours away walking distance one, one, one way, right? For 15 years, he walked five hours every Sunday, two and a half going, two and a half coming, just so he could be with other believers that loved the Lord and that he could continue to grow in his walk with Christ. During that time, the Lord spoke to him and said, don't get too comfortable walking, which how would you up to two and a half hours? But he decides that, you know what, it's time to plant a church among my community, the Batois. And so in 2023, he goes to the church planting school. He graduates last year and he launches his church in January of this year. This picture was taken in March of 2024. This is a Thursday morning. There were more than 100 batois. Remember the people group that had, there were no known Christians. There were 100 batois in that church waiting for us. And he walks around like this. Like that is not a fake smile. Like I try to smile as much as he smiles and my face starts hurting and I feel fake. But he just like, it just like exudes out of him. It's just like, there's just such a joy in this man's heart and life. And I just feel like it's so important that we remind ourselves of the mission of God this morning and of your and I's call and assignment to be on partnership with Jesus. So, go, show, know, and grow. Lord, we thank you for your word today. I've tried to release it as simply as you gave it to me. I thank you that your word is always anointed, that it will not return to you without accomplishing the purpose that you sent it. Lord, as we prepare our hearts in this moment for what's coming in communion, but we just ask that you would deal with 
areas of our hearts and lives that need to be more fully submitted and surrendered to the cross. Lord, for people who are bound by fear in this place, that Lord, today would be a moment when there would be a confidence that would be released in and through their hearts and in and through their lives. Lord, we're grateful for what you're doing in the nations. And before we close, Lord, we just, we pray for Simeone, we pray for Jean Baptiste, we pray for Etienne, and we pray for the other 49 church planters going through this year. And we're just believing, Lord, that you're going to continue to build your church in Burundi and beyond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Bailey's going to come and lead us through the uh, communion process. Yeah, can we all stand together this morning? thinking about some of those brothers and sisters up there and the privilege I've had to sit across the table from many of them. Many of you in this room, I've had the privilege to have a meal with and many people from different cultures and languages than my own even. And there's something so beautiful when we come to a table and we have fellowship together is you kind of have a different pace. It's a slower pace, right? It's not this, hey, how are you? We're good, see you later. It's, hey, how are you really doing? And maybe, maybe, you know, the kids do something funny and everybody laughs and maybe you share something that's hard going on and you hold space for one another. Maybe you get to know, hey, we grew up in the same town and didn't even know it. There's so many beautiful things that can take place in a more intimate, slower way when we come to the table. And I think this, if we're not, if we're not careful, this can become something just monotonous that we do. This, this liturgy can just become something that, yeah, we do that on Sundays and we forget we get to be in the presence of the King and He wants to share His heart with us. He wants to share His heart for people. He wants to share His heart for those wounded places in us that sometimes we have biases, right? Sometimes our reaction is outrage or anger or frustration. And He's saying, no, I wanna share my heart with you for those people. I wanna share my heart with you for the people that are around you in your life. And so this morning, while we're thinking missionally, we're thinking that missional shift, can we keep that in mind? And can we slow down this morning and just ask Jesus to give us his heart? Can we remember that we are part of his body, the body that was broken as we partake that this morning? I'm gonna invite the communion team to come forward and prepare the elements here. As we say our liturgy together, it'll be up on the screens if you wanna follow along. For the weary, the table is our rest. For the burden, the table is God's embrace. For the sick, the table is heaven touching earth. For the doubting and confused, the table is God's mystery revealed. For the bitter and hurting, the table is God taking our pain. For the anxious and worried, the table is our immovable hope. For the divided and disconnected, the table is where we become one. For the unbeliever, the table is an invitation to take Christ. At the table, we declare that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Can we pray together this morning? Jesus, we love you in this place. We thank you for the privilege to be called the sons and the daughters of God. As Stephen so wonderfully articulated that we get to participate in advancing your kingdom. We get to receive your heart and walk out the, in the domain to build your kingdom. We wanna remember this morning as we're allowed to gather here publicly and even online that there are those around the world, brothers and sisters in our body who are being persecuted for their faith who don't have the same privileges to assemble like this. And this morning, we wanna just speak your strength to your persecuted church. We wanna remind them that you are faithful and we ask that your word would run swiftly through them. God, it would accomplish that which it's sent forth to do. Lord, we remember our brothers and sisters like Stephen just prayed across East Africa and across the globe. We thank you that you are building your church. We ask this morning, would you help us be a part of that missional living? Would you help us to get your heart for the people around us and for the people around the world? We love you, Jesus. We're talking from Luke's writings today. So the communion verse that we like to use out of Luke is Luke chapter 22. It says, and he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. 
and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Please feel free to follow your section to the front and receive communion.